So we have to start thinking about it and not just thinking about how our slums will grow or something, but we have to think about what is it that makes cities as a force for good instead of a force for bad. And we find out that you, it, you go back to core, inst core issues of institutions. What kind of an institutional arrangement will allow cities to be a force of good and what will do just the opposite, which is what we have. And we find out that the answers lie again in two or three things. It's about the ways of organizing and how many ways of organizing do you allow in a plural democratic kind of a setup. Just so that, you know, one solution, one major transmission transfer is going to solve all our problems. Of course it won't. Okay. So what we have to do is recognize that there are different types of institutions to handle wicked problems. Wicked problems cannot be solved by one single solution. You need multiple solutions at the same time so that if something works, good. If something doesn't work and falls by the wayside, there's something else working. So these multiple solutions have to be brought in. How are multiple solutions brought in? By multiple institutional types, or as we call it, ways of organizing. There are basically three active ways of organizing. You can have government organizations, you know, municipalities owned by, operated by governments and all that. It's one form of organization, but it's not enough as we've seen in Kathmandu case. You, know. you can let markets and tankers and things do their job, bottle water, that's also important and necessary, but certainly not sufficient. And finally, in the case of Kathmandu, some of the Dungedharos that Ajay showed, most of them are run by religious trusts and guthis and temples and so on. Okay. So which means you've got to go back to allowing some state kind of bureaucratic, hydrocratic institutions, some market-led kind of institutions to work that take risks, do new things, bring in new technologies, and you should tap into those institutions that tap into deeper sentiments. The portion after signing that Bhagmati declaration that which I was also a signatory, Ajay was one where you said, you know, if we die, don't consign our ash to Bhagmati. And we all started getting worried, you know, I said, damn it, you know, what happens if one of us dies, you know, and where do we carry this guy, you know. Luckily, there was one member of parliament, a teacher from a Sanskrit university, who got elected in 19, I think it was 1990. He was appointed as a member of this Bhagmati Commission, Bidur Paudel. And it's thanks to his singular concentration, because he was a Sanskrit teacher, and to him, the idea of a sewer at Bhagmati, at Pashupatinath, was, you know, an insult. Well, he managed to set up, without any foreign aid, mind you, the first sewerage treatment plant that functioned. The World Bank and the German government had set up three plants around Kathmandu, which did not even get one drop of sewerage at all in their history. The money was spent and never worked. This one worked, it still works. So at least the section in front of Pashupati is still clean. So I think our consciences are slightly assuaged and, you know, I think uh, it's, it's not the solution, but it's a very small solution. I'll tell you one story. <clears throat> at Pasupati, when it was at the worst stage of being a sewer, the Bhagmati there, Shivaratri had come around and we get tons and tons of pilgrims coming from India and everywhere in Nepal and all. And the government, because the river was already a sewer, had done, you know, brought in a pipe water where people could take their bath. And there were policemen assigned to make sure people didn't get into the river. And Shivaratri happens at the low season, which means that the river is stinking. It's a sewer. So this policeman is trying to stop these Naga Sadhus, you know, there's lots of Naga Sadhus that come there. And uh, in uh, the conversation in Nepali, Hindi can be pretty funny because, you know, a Nepali policeman telling this Naga Sadhu not to go into the river to bathe. Uh, and the Nepali idea of Hindi is just speak Nepali and add hai at the end and that becomes Hindi. It's a really funny conversation where he's telling the Sadhu, he says, you can't go, the river is very dirty. The Sadhu looks at this policeman and says, I haven't taken a bath for 12 years. You know, who can be a major sa ganda kaun hai? You know, <laughs> brandishing his trishul at the same time, you know. So this idea that, you know, a river has some other values is something that we cannot get out of either economics or engineering. They are important as disciplines, but right now they've been so hegemonic in our public policy to the tune that they have filtered out these other disciplines from literature and poetry and spirituality and sociology and what have you, that unless we bring this volunteerism that comes from these other disciplines, we will not be able to clean the river. 
plain economic arguments about river and plain technical arguments about river while necessary are hardly sufficient to get the river clean again. One example and that happened about two years ago, Bagmati in Kathmandu Valley has 136 Tirthas. And there's a tradition of people once every, well generally it's about every 12 years, but the trouble with these religious things is, these long-term religious things, the Bhagmati Yatra it's called, has to be determined astrologically and it needs a very funny astrological combination and you never know which year. So it, it hadn't happened for 36 years, right, or something like that. And Bhagmati Yatra happened after 36 years and very young people took part in that Yatra where you walk the whole day and then, you know, stay in bed for the next three weeks because your feet are swollen at the end of it. But you go on all these 36 pilgrim sites around the different parts of the Bhagmati springs and rivers and all that. Now, if people are motivated enough to restore these 136 Tirtha sites on Bhagmati, and you can get people, you cannot do it by assigning a water tariff. It has to be by some other feeling of people saying, no, I want to do this because I have certain other values coming in. Now, if these kind of things can come in, then perhaps we have a hope that in addition to economics and engineering, you bring in some other value systems through other institutional means. I will end with one example of hope, and this is something we've been studying for a while, not exactly sure how it applies to the case of Nepal. And my favorite expression is the cleanup of the Rhine. Now, the Thames has been cleaned up, and uh, I don't know much studies about those, but the Rhines, the sociology of the Rhine cleanup is very interesting, and it matches that, what we call cultural theory that Ajay showed with that four quadrants. What was interesting was they had set up uh, sort of the Rhine Commission in the, early in the 50s, not the commission itself, but the Dutch took a lead because they're like Bangladesh at the end of the sewer uh, that comes in. Rhine was the sewer of Europe. Uh, and Bhagwati pollution is nothing compared to what uh, the Rhine was because Rhine went through the heartland, industrial heartland of where the industrial revolution took place. In fact, the Bhagmati, Peter Glick, uh, my friend uh, from Berkeley, was in one of our meetings and we had one of those fancy meters to find out immediate, you know, BOD content and pollution and uh, uh, BH content and all that uh, electric conductivity. And we're doing it at the worst part of Kathmandu Valley's Bhagmati. And the funny part was that the pH content where the river was stinking was like a fresh mountain stream. And we said, how can this be? I mean, this is a sewer. You can't even stand next to it without next to suffocating. Well, it turns out that the good news was the pollution was all organic, that there was no chemical pollution there, which meant that it is still solvable. It's easily solvable if you really get to it. If it's a chemical pollution, then you have hell. You can't do it. So this is where that uh, thing came. Now, in the Dutch case, uh, in 1950s, they had set up this commission. It became official in 1963. Until 1976, you know, they had a first agreement, but nothing was happening. It was still a sewer. And there was international deadlock because each of the six countries were taking these nationalistic positions, you know, and, you know, what I lose, you'll gain, and what you gain, I'll lose kind of thing. Then in November 1986, there was the famous Sandoz spill that polluted the Rhine, killed, you know, whatever was left to kill there, and it was really a disaster. All kinds of cities along the Rhine, you know, which used that water, treated it and all, could not use it and all. Interesting that the Dutch minister at that point, Nelly Kroos, uh, you know, she did something amazing, which shows that, you know, individuals do matter, like Bidur Paudel in Kathmandu, the gentleman who brought that uh, sewage treatment plant on top of Pashupati to make the water in Pashupati, at least in front of Pashupati, uh, you know, dippable. Uh, she said, yeah, there is this Rhine Commission and it's deadlocked, it's not going anywhere. Leave it, you know, but don't expect the Rhine Commission to do anything. She said, well, while you guys are doing your work, I'm going to do something else. So what she did was she hired some very interesting external consultants and said, give me some good advice. It's known as the McKinsey Report. It made some four interesting recommendations, basically. There's a lot of things in there, but it has a lesson for us. The first was, and this goes counter, it's very counterintuitive and goes against all our thinking, which she said, the intergovernmental arrangements between the six different countries should be informal and non-binding. And we said, wait a minute, how can it be? It has to be formal binding thing, you know. No, they said, just make it informal and non-binding. The other thing they said is, you know, again, there's been no formal treaties. Hmm? There should be verbal agreements to reach standards. It's very, again, counterintuitive. Then they said, leave the responsibility of implementing those agreements informal to the lowest level of government, the cantons and the landers. 
and let them do it in partnership with the local businesses and the local environmental groups and others. Okay? And finally, they said the government level should maintain the minimum standards of expression of good intent, uh, the minimum of regulation, and they did only two things at the governmental international level. They said, one, we will eliminate these 15 most toxic, whatever it is from the whole area, you know, and from the river. That's the first thing they said. Without specifying when they would do it and all, they said, we'll leave it to the each lander in Canton to do it. And they made another statement there. They said, we will return the salmon to the Rhine. And everybody laughed. It's the sewer of Europe and you want the salmon back on the Rhine. Well, now they have the salmon back on the Rhine. Yeah. And they eliminated the 15 most toxic things way ahead of the schedule that they said they would do it. The lesson here is a couple of things. The couple of lessons that come here, which is va valuable, extremely valuable for us to reflect over in Bagmati or you know, Yamuna or Sabarmati or wherever. One is to make sure that there's space for this market, communities, and governmental institutions. Give them space. Give all of them space. It can't only be done by governments. It will not only be done by markets. Okay. This public-private partnership fad that's going on is, is, a, is a disaster. The second is allow the lowest levels of government and social units the space to function. And in Nepal's case, there will have to be these religious trusts and goodies that manage the temples along the banks. Somehow they have to be brought in as partners. And finally, you have to bring in these other values that people value besides economics and engineering. These other values of sacredness of rivers and find out who is it and where is it that those values are and seek to promote them. And in this way, we might be able to save our rivers. Thank you.